On this podcast, we're going to be talking to all different kinds of people that are all on their own journey and they've all got their own story to tell. We're going to go beneath the surface. My name's Paul Schweiler and I hope you enjoy. Tim Longmore, thanks for making the journey down from um, Mornington. We appreciate you uh, coming all the way out. And, of course, Tim, for those of you that are watching and hearing and listening in this, um, Tim Longmore is the owner of LBD Studios, previous superstar real estate oh, agent. No. I must can't take all the credit. Jess, Jess sort of. Yeah, we'll right. talk about beautiful, your beautiful wife, Jess. But, um, and, and of course, the, the brains and, and Tim put everything together for our brand, so, which we're very thankful for. But, um, but I think it's good. For the listeners today and the people that are watching in, just to get a bit of an understanding of of yourself, um, LBD Studios, how it all evolved, where you come from, and of course we'll talk a little bit about how it all eventuated with us even collaborating in the start. And um, but yeah, introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about Tim Longmore, and and of course speaking on behalf of Jess as well. Yeah. So my background has always sort of been in sales. Uh, even from a young kid, I was thinking about it on the way here, and like even when I was uh, when it was safe to in the 80s, you could walk around and knock on people's doors when it was all safe and well to do that. I'd be walking around um, knocking on doors trying to wash people's cars <laughs> and trying to make money. So I was a hustler from back in the day. How much are you getting paid for that? I was, I was some gold coin donations back yeah. then, which was a bit of money. Yeah. So I was always a people person, um, mm. didn't have a great attention span unless I loved it. Uh, I found out later last year that I actually did have ADHD as a child, only found out as an adult. Yeah, and right. I think that's kind of helped me a lot through my adulthood, even though it's come with some challenges. How do they test that at this age? Uh, well, it was a ch- when I was I was diagnosed with it as a kid, mm. but I was never told. So yeah. that's a that's a whole other podcast. But it's it's been good because if I love something, I just get so in, immersed in it, and yep. I could be an expert in that top it's topic within. Yeah, you know, I just Quickly. go down the vortex. Mm. So always been people focused. Um, went to high school, had a love of sport. Couldn't kind of find my, my role through university or, or study. Ended up working various sales roles. Mm. Ended up working at Mercedes-Benz in car and luxury automotive. Really enjoyed that. And then one of my next-door neighbors said, you should get into real estate. Like, you'd be good at that. And I'm like, oh, sure, I'll, I'll go and give it a go. Um, and that was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. So, How old were you then? Uh, it would have been like 2010, would have been like 27 maybe. Yeah, right. Um, I dabbled in it earlier. did a cadetship early 20s, but probably just wasn't ready to commit, ready to give real estate what it needed. Mm. So I went back to it and I found it really hard to be honest. Like the first year I was like a couple of times I think I was ready to quit and uh, John Stack at the time who I was working at Barry Plant, I said, no, nah, I'm done. Like fuck, I'm out. I just, I can't do this because I'd gone from working in a business where all your leads come to you. Mm. Your Mercedes people walk in off the floor yep. to buy a car. So now you've got to find your own business. Mm. It's a totally different mindset. Is that what you found the hardest? Found that the hardest. And also where to spend your time because you have so much free time, but you could waste your time doing activities that just don't bring a return. Yeah. So John's like, like, I don't know, man. Like, I think you should give it, I think you should, don't quit. Just give it, just give it a crack. And I'm thankful that he did that. Like, because I stuck at it and, uh, I soon realized that I was probably wasn't at the right agency at that time. Mm. Very grateful for the opportunity to start. Mm. But Noel Jones at the time were always getting the bigger homes, always getting the homes that I wanted to get. So I'm like, all right, well, got chatting with Matt Scafidi. And yep. then before I knew it, I was recruited over there. Mm. Um, you know, when we, we did some incredible things, we launched an agency um, into a new market, gained market share and built a really good business of up to about 20 people and was doing quite a lot of things there. Because mm. um, you – um. Like you were a high performing agent, you know, you're a million dollar writer. You, um, you obviously were a director of Noel Jones as well. Like you weren't just a real estate agent, like you were a high performing agent, like to step out of real estate when you're doing well, you're earning good money to go and chase what turned out to be your dream. Um, bold move. Like, were you nervous about it? Like, tell us about, cause how long are you in real estate? I had been in there about seven, eight years, but it was a very sharp growth curve. Yeah. Um, you know, got close to the million dollar mark back in the day, but it would be now pro rata, but what I was sort of doing. Of course. Had a great support network. And I'm really thankful for that time. But mm. something happened when we had Smith, our first child. I was mm. like, I've got some great business partners, but mm. at the time we just all wanted different things. Mm. And that's okay. Like we all just wanted different age groups. And when, when you're in business, you can't do it without great people. So. Mm. 
we had a great team, but I think we just it, it just couldn't for some reason we all couldn't achieve out of things what we wanted. And at the time, Jess has had sort of this talent for branding and design. We really wanted to push it. We really wanted to become an independent, and it was pretty clear to me that wasn't going to happen. So I started sort of thinking, well, my time's really important, and it's not to say that those people who don't have kids at their time isn't important, but yeah. when you've got a child, you know, you want to be around for the kid, and you start looking at things differently. Mm. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go and give property development a go because I love design, I love buildings and architecture. And a friend of mine got me into working for Bueller, yep. which are a great developer in Australia. Yep. Um, and that was amazing. I learned more in that 18 months than I probably did in eight years about construction, development. So I forgot about that little, little patch, things, yeah. All these little things were teaching me things, but I realized too then that this kind of wasn't going to be my future after being an owner, a business owner. I, was, I found it challenging to go back just to sort of, not answering to someone else, but sort mm, of, you know, mm, it's very mm. hard. So what what was it? Do you remember a specific moment or a day or a time where maybe the penny dropped for you where you, you thought, you know what, real estate isn't my future? Was there a was, – did something happen? I think looking back at my life, I was always very creative from a very young age. I, mm. I, I in, enrolled into TAFE and did multimedia for about three weeks till I got sick of that. Um, but I was always a fairly creative person, even when I was in real estate trying to come up with new concepts, new ideas. I was always kind of the first person to bring in video or whatever it was. Yeah. I was always sort of seeking that transformation or innovation piece. Mm. And I remember sitting in a, in a meeting and we had some crea- a creative studio coming into Beulah and they're pitching all these ideas. And I'm like, Jess is awesome at creative and branding and design. Like I can sell. I can sell anything, whether it's cars, real estate, yep. property development. I've got a track record. Mm. Like why don't I just go and do that? Mm. Just go and actually help her run LBD Studios and see where we can take it. And that was the exciting thing. So we won a job, funnily enough, through Danny Han at the time. It was a fairly we big job. We love Danny Han. Yeah. Thanks, Danny. So it was a fairly big job and Danny was really supportive at the time. He always loves kind of nurturing those up-and-comers and he's always on the on the bandwagon and, yeah. and, and, and that's a great trait of his. So <clears throat> I thought if we can land this job when I'm still semi-somewhat employed, what could I do if I had full-time in the business? Like what could we go and do? So yeah. I resigned from Bueller, told them what we're doing um, and that was about 2018, 2019, mm. about five years ago now. Mm. Yeah. And leading up to that, Jess was always in this sort of creative marketing background anyway. Like did it always start LBD? Jess had worked in – Jess's Jess's background was quite interesting because mm. she worked in um, – Advertising, she so you know, advertising big agencies, big budgets as an internal designer. She'd gone and worked client side for like a big packaging company like Aurora or um, Vizzy, that kind of type of product. Yeah. Then she worked for small branding agencies, and she loved branding. She loved seeing that transformation of people. So her her skill set was quite unique too, because she's seen the full the full gamut of how branding works from big advertising, TVC budgets, through to like in house design through mm. to branding and, mm. and she found herself in branding. So she went – while I was in real estate and we were making fairly good money at the time, she decided she built up a few clients on the side. She's like, all right, that's it. I'm just going to go and she went. But she always said to me, I would never do it without a running partner and I sort of didn't understand that at the time mm. but I do now because there's no way you could possibly be creatively directing, doing the work, doing the account management, bringing in the business, running all the – it's just too many things. Yeah. So we're kind of like yin and yang. We're polar opposites. Yeah. But it's kind of like work. Do you work together well? I think we work together really well now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I not. mean, from the outside looking in, it seems you work really well together. But um, you maybe know, not in the early days. I think I tried to come in and throw everything around. When she kind of had a lot, she's very good at process and systems. Mm. Uh, I'm very good with people, and so I think now we just she's good at what she does, and I do what I do. Yeah. And we respect that. And how does Jess go with? Because, like I said before, you know, you're always looking to innovate and and try new things and go down different paths, does she need to ever feel like she needs to rein you in a little bit or does she sort of trust your creative mind and sort of let you go with what you're feeling and saying? So given what I told you earlier, like mm. the idea, the, the, I'm, I'm never short of thoughts. I'm <laughs> never short of ideas. In fact, I think you probably you, you probably have something. Like if you've, got, if you've got to be a little bit crazy to do some of the stuff yeah. you want to go and do. Yeah. So I've always got lots of ideas. But she's the one that will either execute or implement them. So mm. there's definitely times where, She'll be like, show me a plan. What are you going to do? What's going to happen? So I don't want to be that person that starts something and then stops it. So, um, yeah, she's very – she's a great sounding board. Yeah. Because um, you are um, – Emily and I were even talking about this this morning, like just the way you speak and you think and um, you seem to be very measured with everything that you say. 
like you, in a sense, you're saying that there's an ADHD part that you know you're all in and you give it everything, but it still seems that your thought process and your delivery is extremely measured more so than maybe what some other people might be. Like you're not just guns blazing. In your head, you might be guns blazing, but by the time you actually action on it, it's you seem to be very measured in your approach. Is that fair to say, do you think? Yeah, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I know how Jess always said it last night, like whether you have the gift of the gab or not, mm. I always just found like speaking really easily, Yeah, especially if it's a topic I'm chatting to someone and maybe that's I can just fully dial into the conversation. Yeah, Like I can, I can be in a team meeting mm. and people might think I'm rude, like I'm on my phone, I'm walking, I won't sit down. Mm. But then if I'm in, if I'm into a conversation, <laughs> I, I, I could literally be something building it, burning over there. I'm not watching it. Yeah. I'm not paying any attention yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. the measuredness, I'm not sure where it comes from to be yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah. It's probably a good trait because, you know, you've obviously got so much thinking and going on and you've got this process where you've got a plan and you want to get to it. But I think by the time it actually comes out, it's so well thought out from the outside. You might not think it is. But even still, like I always found that um, – working together with you, maybe because you've got a real estate background. I don't think I've ever had anyone take words out of my mouth like you. Can, like sometimes I wonder if you can see my mind because <laughs> I struggle. I've said this to you before. Like I'm like, how did you just literally say what I'm thinking with such ease? You seem to just know what, and maybe not me, it's probably all your other clients as well. You probably got a really good knack of getting an understanding of what people want and being able to, um, actually talk about that and make it a little bit clearer even for the person that's talking about it. So I got that with you a lot. You know, you took words out of my mouth a lot. And I've done two brands with you and I'm like, man, this guy just gets it right, you know. And um, obviously being in your creative path, like you, you just need to possibly have that gift, I suppose. I think uh, one thing I think I do, I want to say I do extremely well, but I'm, I feel like I've, I'm very strong at is putting myself – in someone else's shoes. Mm. I'm very objective. And so that's why I think the studio works well too because the, the team might design something I like. I, I, I feel like I'm the consumer. I put myself, I pretend, and maybe that's my sales background from like, you know, if you want to, um, what's the saying? If you want to um, sell to Tom Smith, you need to see through Tom Smith's eyes. You need to see exactly mm. what the person's seeing that might be thinking about it. Mm. And so, yeah, I think it's that object. I don't ever, I'm not here saying I'm an expert. I know it all. I will really try and get in someone else's head to figure out what they're trying to do. Mm. And that's extremely satisfying when I, when that happens. Like for me, that's that transformation piece. Yeah. Actually, I've got some questions for you and something must happen for you around January time every time because I went, I went over my notes today. 5th of February 2020, you called me. You said, Tim, um, I need on a, you're at Morrison claim at the time. I need to do a letterbox drop or something. I said, Paul, please, like a letterbox drop. Come in, let's have a chat. Let's We can do more for you than a letterbox drop. Yeah. And I think within about a week, we'd signed on for a whole branding exercise. Yeah. And not long thereafter, you launched your first agency. Mm. Then I looked again when the second agency sort of came to fruition. It was the fifth, was sixth of February? We signed off on a new proposal for the second agency. Was it that close? It was. So we're, what's happening next month? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> next week. There's something. That's we're we're, we're, we're having a conversation after this chat about something else. So that's I, reckon, in my head. I reckon what it is for you. <clears throat> If I'm getting inside your head, mm. is you go away in January to Phillip Island, yeah. you go away, you have that free thought to think and reimagine like what's next, where can I take this thing? Mm. And so like our journey, our journey has been interesting because you came and chat to me when I was in real estate and you hadn't got into it yet. Yeah. And to see how far, you've, funny done, that, how far like, you've done that. Yeah. It's awesome. I knew other people in real estate at that time. Like back then we knew each other, but we weren't close, right? Yeah, yeah. And rather than go to the, the closer people that I knew that were working in real estate, I actually didn't really want their opinions or their thoughts. I didn't want them to judge or anything like that. So I, I, I drove out to, to Mitchum, didn't I? And, we, yeah. and I picked your brain on C63 real estate. Three wagon, I remember. Yeah, I missed that car. <laughs> My wife made me sell it. Um, <laughs> probably a smart move now. Yeah, right? probably. Um, but yeah, I drove all the way out. You were the only person, the, on, the one and only person that I went and, and you know, got some advice from and your thoughts on getting into real estate. And then you sit here and we're like full circle. You've created two brands for me and, and you know, job's not finished yet. So it's funny that – it's funny how the world works. But, um, but yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up about um, so I look time at patterns. frames. I look at patterns with people and – Well, I guess, things. you know, it's, it's the time where the years just so go, go, go. It's that one time where I can sit on the sand and stare at the ocean and 
brainstorm things a little but that bit. Is, that is actually working. That's yeah. one thing I've learned being in the creative field is that thinking is work. Mm. Think like, you know, when someone comes to you with a problem, you're like, I just can't figure it out yet. Yeah. I'll come back to you. Mm. That happens a lot. Kiara will say, oh, what, what do we do here? I'm like, just give me, I'll come back to you in a couple of hours. Then I'll think about it and then I'll do it. Mm. And so maybe that's that measured approach. It's like not just shooting off and thinking, like thinking uses your brain power. Mm. And when you're in a creative environment, I would say probably all my all my creative visions for productions or brands or whatever mm. never come from being in the office. No. They always come from being driving with the music pumping or out on a walk. You just see something and your brain is using different things when that happens because yep. you're not in a – the creative process, it's not linear. You can't just go cool, ticked it off like an accounting job. It's it's very – you have to wait for a vision or something to be inspired yep. by that. Yeah, yeah. So when you take that into your life, you can get inspired by just having a break. Mm. And that's hard in real estate because mm. real estate is nonstop, twenty four seven, on all the time. Mm. You can mm. get you can get some white space, yep. but you've got to build towards that. Yeah, that's right. Build a team, build <clears> a <throat> system. So, yeah, yeah. So it's been cool to see how you've how you've done this as well. LBD Studios, tell us a little bit a bit more about. Um, I'd love to give our listeners and and watchers here a bit of an idea of, you know, some of the brands that you've been involved in. You know, because obviously people now know that you're the you're the brains behind the Schweiler identity um and obviously our previous agency that we're with and but you've been in you've been involved in some some big name stuff i know some of the people that you work alongside like sarah prescott um i think she was she did everything around the thank you the, the soap brand and all that sort of stuff like what other things have you been involved with it's been quite fascinating obviously real estate there's a strong connection with real estate and that'll always be i love i love real estate i still love it i kind of feel like i can get my little fix without having to be in, be in real estate you yeah. know it's and it's nice to be able to share um some experiences i had but the studio now is so varied in the work that we a lot of it's property it could mostly be property related but there's other uh, avenues now as well where health medical wellness um dental boutiques quite a big brand you work with um law firms and all that law I'm saying. Firms, yep. um we working with Cotty parker who are a big architecture practice in brisbane they've got offices around australia um they, how did you how did you get that gig well so we had done a project marketing um identity for a project in cotton tree in queensland for a developer called cube um and we did a, a project called nature and it was an incredible pro. It was we were so fortunate to work on it. It was like seven stories, basically full floor apartments at forty five. It was just a beautiful project to work on. We collaborated with X Media on that project. It went on to win some awards for its design effectiveness, uh, and they were the architect on the job. And so they saw all the work we'd done. They said, "Hey, we actually had just you know we're thinking about doing our website." And so we had some discussions. Um, and so I said to Jess, "It's been pretty cool to sort of see." That evolution from us working just from our apartment mm. studio to now having like you know national architecture brands with 200 people coming to us for advice on how to best position and present their brand like that excites me. Do you still get? Do you still have pinch me moments? Definitely. Yeah. Um, but like someone pinch, reaches out to you the like pinch me moments are more like when you guys put up a Christmas photo of your Christmas party, right? Like we've had a conversation, and then nine months later you have a party with 14 people there. Mm. Like that excites me because. Mm. I feel there's a big transformation or encouragement piece in my life where I yeah. just want to speak out the good I've seen people mm. and encourage them. Um, Tani was another one where she was she was employed full time, working somewhere in a quite a high profile aesthetics clinic, and she's like, "Oh, I don't know if I can make this money." Like, I'm really, and Jess and I are just like, we know it's going to happen. We've seen this before. We know what the combination of our design and brand work, as well as someone who's hungry and good at their job. Yeah, when you put those together. Yeah. Like it's it can't not yeah <laughs> yeah yep. and so I think she went on in the first three months to do what she'd done in twelve months like mm, so, amazing. so the excitement piece for the pinch me moments surprisingly are making sure that when someone's coming through the studio their brand works like it makes money it's profitable it's mm. a trailblazer in that industry mm. it's not it's not so much the clients yeah it's it's making sure that they felt incredible value through that yeah. interaction with us beyond creating the scope of work. It's like, does that mean that you would get clients come to you where from your behalf, you might openly say that we're, we're just not a match for sure. Do, if, if it's I, not working and you're not seeing the vision they are and they're like, do you say no to business? Definitely. I yeah. think it's like pretty upfront. We kind of position people to say where our, where our costs lie. And I think, 
I would say our clients now are experienced business owners. They're mm. not startups. If mm. they're startups, they're someone that's done it before yep. and they understand the value of creative design in business. Mm. They understand the value of design. If someone's like, I want a logo, I'm like, already, you're not, you're not the client. Like, we don't do logos. Let me jump in. I, I really value that because in our previous conversations, you know, like I, I've some people have asked me where we get our branding done and all that sort of stuff and I'm like, you know, just call Tim from LBD and then they'll reach out to you and and then you've given me feedback. They just wanted a logo. Like it's not about – it's great to have a beautiful logo but what I've learned now that I've been through two complete business um, branding exercises with you is you, you build it from the from the bottom up. Like it would take weeks before we had a visual identity. It would be more about values and what the business means to you and, you, you know, you're putting all your heart words down and all that sort of stuff before you even get a visual. And that's the most sometimes the exciting part because we wanted to say what do we look like? We know we've told you what sort of colours and all that sort of stuff we like, but sometimes you wait until week 10 or 8 before you actually see what you're going to look like. Whereas most people, that's probably what they put their first value on is just make me a logo and it's not about that, is it? Yeah. And, and that's not to say that people that do logos, there's nothing against that. There's mm. some people and some – businesses where that's all they need like that's that's they don't want to go and spend this sort of money on a brand to do all that mm. so that's fine but there's many things that make up a brand the people the culture the brand experience all the deliverables all the touch points through to operations operational excellence is part yeah. of that yeah how they're going to walk into your store if if you're a physical store how's it going to smell how's it going to look activate it's not just the, the brand mark and the big brands know this like you know and and brands that actually have a purpose uh, a purpose-led businesses return like 11% more profit than industry competitors. That's proven. So mm. it's not only fluffy stuff, it's there to make sure the business knows what it's about, what it's not about um, because that then plays into the visuals because then if you know what the brand's about, we know how it visually could be articulated well, yep. then through the tone of voice and then through the, its things. So, mm. so it's not about like <clears throat> I can tell pretty quickly if we're just not going to be a good alignment with someone and that's okay. Um, Do you find it hard to say no? Not really. No. Because I think my real estate was such a good um, proving ground on, you know, dealing with dealing with different opinions, rejection. Like it was incredible. Honestly, real estate, if anyone's had the fortunate um, time to work in it, it's such a good grounding. It's such a good framework for you to learn in business in general. Mm, 100%. I think, yeah, real estate can can – toughen you up in that regard there's probably a, i can understand why it's probably easy for you to say no to some business what what do you think that some businesses out there um do you think that branding and a really good branding is a key element to whether they're going to be successful or not even if behind doors they're amazing like how much does a does a visual brand with tone of voice and all that affect a business that still might be operationally really fantastic so it's, it's a good question because i i think about this a lot and what people don't realize or even when a real estate agency or someone might chat to me i could never get that commission i could never get that marketing it's all a lie that's all a story in your mind you've told yourself like why does someone line up at loon croissant to spend 12 bucks waiting in line for 50 minutes to get something yet the other side of the road there's no one in the shop mm -hmm. that's brand that's positioning so what brand and <coughs> positioning and 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 a good brand is it's really maybe the opportunities you don't get. And so that's the thing. It's like you want a brand to speak to the consumer. And so if you haven't gone through that process, you may think it's all good, but you actually just don't know how far you could have taken it or how far can you articulate it. And then also in addition to that recruitment, yeah. because once your brand looks good, I think the Schweiler brand is probably the best I've ever seen at community engagement, keeping people like you've just run with it. You've got the brand, mm. but not only that, you haven't just used it. Like you're doing food trucks, you're doing Halloween things, you're sponsoring events, you're getting involved in, you know, um, the, I can't remember what it was, the the car racing thing as well. Yeah. Like awesome. So not only are you are just a good business, you're getting involved in the community. So mm. a brand becomes more than that. So all these parents at the school now go, oh, Schwala, yeah, like not only do they sell houses, like they're actually putting money into my kid's school. Yeah. So it's not just about, yeah, so I think to answer the question is like it's not just about the visual ID. It's a, it's a balance of both operations because yep. if you have a great brand and you walk in and the store attendant's rude mm. or they have an inquiry, that, that's that's what people think of your brand. Mm. Mm. So you could have a slick brand but if your customers, are, uh, if your team are rude, yeah, that's a perception. That's over. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a tricky balance. 100%. Um, White Fox Real Estate. 
Marty Fox. A lot of people may not hear of them or some people will know them. Obviously, Marty, successful in real estate, judge on the block. But uh, you designed White Fox, did you not? So the White Fox brand is a, a great case study of where someone really knows what they're about. Mm. So at the time I was still working in real estate, Jess was had started LBD Studios and she'd been working on the sort of identity behind the scenes. Um, Aiden at the time was doing the tone of voice, but Jess did all, a lot of visuals componentry for it, yeah. which hasn't changed. Yeah. So that brand though gets talked about a lot mm. and for a lot of good reasons. I think it was probably a good segue for what we just spoke about mm. because they know what they're about and they know what they're not about. Mm. And they're not afraid to put money behind put a high-end productions, put money behind every touch point and run with it. I think a lot of people, even if you're not in real estate, they just don't execute at a high enough level. Mm. And that's not something our clients do. It's just an observation. Like it's actually really, really hard to grab the brand, even like you guys have, and run with it because mm. you need people that are passionate about it and going to go and do it. Yep. So they were probably the first company that came in. Was that different. your first big client, would you have thought? Well, they became a big client, you know, yeah. as they've evolved. Like they've built it into a great business and what it is today. Mm. And that's through a number of facets, brand being one of them, I'm sure attraction of the right people and recruitment, but it's also what they've done with it, you know. So it's kind of what you're saying, like it's a blend of both. You can't yeah. have one without the other. You need <clears> the brand, but mm. you need the great people as well. Yeah, right. And what about um, what about brand refresh? Like if you've got a really solid visual, like us for example, is there a time frame where you think it it's worth that meeting in the middle and go, right, you look great, you've been here for X amount of years, it's time to actually do a bit of a refresh? Is, is that something that you talk about with your clients? Is there a time that are quicker than others where maybe a rebrand or just a, a tweak, like a facelift is required? What? How does that work for you? How do you see it? I think it's – it's kind of like an evolution. A Porsche is a good example mm. where they don't just drastically change it. They just keep changing it, slowly tweaking it. Yeah. It depends on the brief and it depends on the business goals and objectives. Like if they've been acquired and they want to go into a new market, maybe that brand doesn't now do what it needs to do. And so sometimes what can happen with brands in particular is their capability can quickly outgrow the brand. But generally we've been engaged at that point. But I guess what I'm saying is sometimes someone will have a brand They've been going for three to five years, done really well, didn't really spend a lot of money or thought on it at the time, mm. but now they need to. Now they need to go that next level and actually need to spend some time on it, spend some money around how it is. So there's no actual time frame, um, but I would say every year you should be checking in across, someone should be that auditor across your brand, looking at your website, your socials, just looking at all the things you're doing. You know, Do we need to send out that fortnightly ADM? Do, are people getting value out of the things we're sending? <laughs> Excuse me. Are people getting value out mm. of the things we're mm. sending them? Mm. Um, do you ever, um, do you ever like big brands that you've built businesses for, will you pull them up if you feel like they're, they're going, they're going left of what the whole thing was about? Are you, are you brave enough to reach out to the owner and say, listen, I think you're actually gone off track a little bit, your business, but from an outsider and the person that was there with you when we had all the big discussions about what you stand for, I feel like you've gone offline a little bit. Does that something Start, that you, Look, I'm starting to try and tactfully have those discussions yeah it's more about because people if they've invested a lot of money with our studio mm. to get the result and sometimes what can happen is the brand that gets passed on to a social media manager or someone that has no real understanding or depth of the brand mm. and then that's what the consumer sees so we might have done a great brand like think of us like the architect yeah it's handed on and then someone else is now playing with those drawings and, and messing with the intent yeah but at the end of the day you at some point you do have to hand it over they are going to run with it you just hope that you've built the relationship enough that they'll come back and have those discussions mm. or that it can be honest enough where I'll go, hey, that social post you put up, like, you know. I've had a couple sure. you, I've had a couple from you in the past. You've yeah, asked a we, question. We've yeah. got to be that brand police, yeah. brand maniacs. A lot, of, a lot of people may or may not see it, but, um, yeah, it's probably just about building those relationships with people to make sure. And look, the couple of times you've reached out and just softly said, hey, that post you put out a little while ago, not too sure it's in line. Sometimes you just need that to go, you know what, it probably isn't. It, it, it probably isn't, you know, so it's it's nice that you've got your eyes sort of being cast over without us sort of knowing about it. Um, what about the journey from someone that comes in and wants to build a brand? What's your what's your main role in, in the brand building? When do, when are you the, the most heavily involved? 
So probably my role is very much at the start. Um, and I've now kind of moved into doing some of the strategy and positioning work. Mm. Again, we've had collaborators on that part, but I've realized that I've got 20 years business experience. And although I don't have a uni degree, I've seen a lot of things. Mm. And I do have a lot of really good thoughts for positioning and, and whatnot. So um, I work really closely with the majority of the brands at the start to make sure they're positioning. We look at competitors. We have a look at everyone and make sure that you're not going to be like everybody else. Um, obviously, we're in discussions on, on bringing the work in. But yeah. my job is to really kind of what you said at the start is to get in your head and understand how it can translate what's in your head into reality yeah. but perhaps make it even better than that. Yeah. You know, that's – Is that the most enjoyable part for you watching the – like what gives you a kick through watching a brand evolve within Albedo Studios? It's probably the moment where you see them – because it's a, it's a big deal, right? You're investing a lot of money mm. and often people are unsure. Like they may not say it but like they're often scared. Like you're starting a business. Like you're putting a lot of money like – you're not sure how this thing's going to work. You're putting a lot of trust in us to be able to deliver that. And there's often like a lot of fear, emotional fear, like it's going to work and I do this. So when you see the client, when they see the designs, they're like, yep, this is it. Like, yep. I've got it. And you, they take ownership. That's mm. the most rewarding part mm. where we've put in um, maybe a bit like real estate. There's a lot of hidden work yep. in real estate, like yep. the phone calls, the appointments, a lot of wasted time. Everyone yep. sees a sold sticker, mm. but they don't see how many hours and calls and, you know, appointments and all the stuff that goes on to get there. And it's the yeah. same with creative. Everyone sees the end result. Mm. But, you know, we, the studio might have wasted three weeks and then two days before the prayers, we decided to take it a whole different direction. Mm. But it's not a waste of time. That was part of where we had to go to get there. Yeah. So the most enjoyable thing for me is um, it's hard. It's almost post. It's almost once they get it and run with it and seeing how it has connected or, the, you know, you guys came in and had market share straight away. Mm. Um that's the part where I'm like, brand works. Yeah. Like that's it's doing its job. Yeah, yeah. That's where you said That's you awesome. Know. I love that. And I, I know recently you've started to tap into a new part of business. Like you're, you're looking for more of a strategic point of view where you might go into a business and actually get them back online without necessarily helping them with a, with a brand. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so I've kind of had this thought that people often need a brand, uh, but sometimes they just need someone to chat to, someone that's objective. Mm. Um, and I think I think with business coaches, they definitely have their place, mm. but they may not see it through how we see it. We're like, hey, this is a bit off or that's a bit off. So we're looking from a brand perspective, but also um, we see a lot of businesses. Like it's quite fascinating. We see organizations from 200 people through to like four people, one person. And so I feel like when I'm sitting there with someone, I kind of know if they're going to make it. I know, I know if they're going to be an operator or not pretty quickly Yeah, from our interactions and how how – you know, savvy they're going to be. But mm. there's a lot of things that we could recommend that we've done for other clients. Like um, if they're a real estate business, do they need, you know, the receptionist, the admin, the, the concierge, all these fixed costs? Maybe not. There could be some better solutions that our clients are using. So I'm kind of trying to leverage our national clients mm. and figure out how we can help other businesses. Because um, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about growth. It's about making sure things work. Mm. And happiness for each business owner is different. Mm. Mm. Happiness might be that you can knock off at five and go and be home for dinner with your kids. That's cool. Yeah. Um, maybe you've got to put a system in place to make sure the business runs so that can happen. Yeah. And so no one really teaches you about that happiness thing mm. and how to, how to achieve that. They teach you how to go and grow a great business and do all this stuff, but it can actually be a big noose around your neck and yep. weight around, you know, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know? mm. Yeah. So, so LBD Studios was actually – kind of inspired by Tom Panos, funnily enough, who probably sat here not long ago. He has, he sat in that seat. And he said, oh, do you want a life by design or do you want a life by accident? Yeah. And Jess and I both looked at each other like, that's probably one of the best sentence summaries of how to have an intentional life. But, you know, we're a design studio. Like it's cool, life by design. So it was life by design. Then it became LBD Studios. So a lot of people think it's little black dress studios. It's not. So there's some intent behind it. It's about making sure that we're not just delivering design outcomes, but we're helping people live a better life. I know it sounds cheesy, but that's kind of what drives us. Like if I wanted to make money, I would have stayed in real estate. Like, you know, we're doing well, but I could definitely, there's other industries where you could leverage and make more money quicker. And mm. so for us, it's about that transformation. It's about the balance, the happiness. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. And I mean, off the from a balance and happiness point of view, that's not so much work related. The transition from moving from a beautiful apartment in Ivanhoe, now you're living in the Mornington Peninsula. What was the driver behind that? Was it was it just a purely lifestyle decision or was it 
Was there any business motive around that? I think Jess had always wanted to live near the beach mm. and I'd always had a mindset like, oh, no, I've got to be around work and I was in real estate. So we kind of never had that opportunity. Yeah. And then with this role, I thought, well, we can be anywhere really. Through COVID, we were delivering projects, you know, Perth, Queensland, Sydney. Sydney's been a big cl like client base that's grown. But so there was no real driver. It was like my, our family was down there, so you could say that was. Yeah. But I think it was a combination of, you know, the lockdowns at the time. We couldn't see our family. Um, our son was only two and a half, three. So mm. we're like before he gets into schools, now be the time to do it. Mm. But everything we do in life, Paul, we're just telling ourselves a story. Yeah. It's all made up. You can you can change the way you're living at any point. Mm. Mm. Do you love living down there? I love it. Is it great? It's great. It's worth the commute, you know. Because mm. um, you've still got an office in… Um, in Malvern. I've been in Malvern. Yeah. Did you think that… Did you always think that you would still need a hub, an, an office? We, Jess and I feel feel like that, yeah. It's nice to have a place to come together. The creative, the creative process is very collaborative. Mm. And while she can do work from home and you can do that, it's nothing replaces like the interaction you have and the, the ideas sharing and reviews and whatnot. So mm. to have a nice inspiring place to come to work, yep. it's, it's good. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. and I think now like there's almost a shift towards like we've done the whole work from home thing and I understand it for certain fields, but I don't know. I don't want to work from home. I, yeah. want to, I want to go into work and have a space where I'm working here. Yes, I can jump on my phone and do – you can pretty much work from your phone these days, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, have, it's being able to segment parts of my life, Yeah, um, which is something in the past I probably wasn't good at. Because, yeah, okay. You know, that was real estate for me. I was on all the time. I was always on my phone. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah, not, saying yeah. it's a, not saying it's a bad thing. It's a required thing. It's, it's needed at times. Mm. Um, and your team, um, how many in your team? So there's four of us, including Jess and I. Yeah. Yeah. So. And because you've got a couple of um, staff members that have sort of been there for a little while now. They're yeah. sort of staple. Francisca's um, been there since the start, really. Yeah. It's quite amazing. She she's was, she fantastic. Was, yeah, she's She's fantastic. Fantastic. She's great. Yeah. So she's kind of been with us on the journey, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. And then Kiara, who funnily enough was one of our clients, um, yeah. sisters came to a shoot. Um, and it could be a good segue to talk about we're always good at identifying talent, even this whole thing here. Yeah. Ali, Ali's producing this. Mm. Ali came to us through an ad. We were growing our production department at the time mm. and had a, quite a few applicants, but Ali stood out because he reached out through LinkedIn. He was texting. He was keen. So whoever's around our brand, Kiara included, she yep. reached out. We're yep. always looking for people that go one next step. It's not that hard just to send a message to someone and go, hey, no, of course. seen your ad. So I look. For, I, we look for those little one percenters yep. to me they make a big difference because yep. it shows you the character of the person mm, mm. that you're dealing with i don't like i know your team's still relatively small from your your core group but what do you do to you know make sure that fran's still feeling creative and and kiara that you're still getting them in the zone to want to come in and perform at a high level you obviously got to you know like just because it's a small group you must have a, a strong little bond or strong little culture there as well so is that just making sure that people get in the office and you get around them and, and collaborating and bouncing ideas off each other? I think we're pretty unique in that um, Kiara had four weeks off last year. Fran, yeah. Fran's got four weeks off going to Japan. And so most small business with a team that small probably wouldn't consider having that much time off work. But you've actually got to enable your team to go and do what they want to do mm. and try and help them achieve yeah. what they want to achieve outside of work. Mm. Um, given we've got a young family – it can be challenging at times for Jess and I to always be in the studio nine to five. It's just not a reality. Yeah. But they don't see after hours we're working, before hours. Like as long as you've got that flexibility yeah. and, you know, the odd team lunch, the, uh, we, we, we just look after people. Yeah. I think you look after them, pay them well. Yeah. If they want a holiday, let them go on a holiday. Don't yeah. be true, you know. <laughs> you boss driven, a hard time, yeah. You know, know. Like, we've yeah. all worked for bosses that check everything of your work and – you want to create an environment where people want to come to work. Yeah, for sure. And I remember Steve Jobs said it like, don't hire people and then manage them. Like, hire people that can manage themselves mm. to some extent. Like, Very true. Just come in and do the job. One hundred percent. Yeah. What? What? What's the short and long term vision for for LBD? Because I know you're always you're always thinking about evolving and that sort of thing. What? Where does where where would you like to take LBD? Is it just about staying in in the capacity that you're at but just doing it really well or are you are you, are you trying to take on more australia-wide business what what is what is your next what's a two-month a two-year goal like what are you, what are you so trying to I achieve we definitely want to win more awards mm. and it's not about trying to win awards for the sake of it but you know we will be 
one of the most known studios in Australia for, for impactful work. Yeah. And I want to be known for impactful. Like that's a like delivering work that works. You know, mm. like I know it's, yeah. again saying the word impactful. Like that's an interesting word to use because it's not because you you it obviously shows where your values are because you want to make an impact not just on your brand but for everyone that you create a brand for you want them to have an impact which funnels back to the core where it was created so um so it's just about more business but being more impactful um do you want to like how big can a creative studio I think, get? I think it needs to be at the same this just sounds really strange but at the same kind of journey as our family life because I don't want to go over committing something that I can't sustain. I'm not around for the kids. I know mm. some people do it. That's all good. There's no judgment. But for me, you know, once the kids get into school, I know we'll have more time to dedicate to business later. Yeah. So it's like success now might be that I'm home for dinner with the kids. I can play around. I can take them to sports. I can do all that stuff. But there'll come a time because I've got nieces and nephews where they don't want to be around mum and dad all the time. They mm. want to do their stuff. So mm. it's trying to match the intensity of my ambition. Yeah with where I'm at in the stage of life with my family because yeah. it is a family business. It's a small business. Um, we'll probably look to grow our sort of, I want to say freelance team, but like if the work's there, it'll come under our direction. But mm. I don't want to go and grow a big 10, 20 person studio because I know what that I know what that brings. It's mm -hmm. like a real estate office. Yeah. Um, so for us, it's just doing great work, being known for doing great work mm. and being able to work with clients that see the value on the journey with us. Um, and short term, it's just to – you know, develop some more content, get ourselves out there a little bit more because it's a bit like the builder's house. We update our work continually but you'll see a lot more of it this year. Mm. Bringing people in behind the scenes a bit more yep. of what happens yep. I think will be interesting. Yep. I'm looking forward to watching that. Yeah. So we, We're very interested by your brand and I think given the sort of person you are and you're very engaging, we like listening to you speak. Like I've really enjoyed just getting another snapshot. Obviously, I know a bit about your history but just to even have a chat today, like we really – you're very engaging human. That's obviously why you're successful at what you do. So, you know, we love watching what you guys do. It's exciting and you just look good. Um, so everything you're doing, it's just working beautifully. And we wish you nothing but success. Like we, we've done two brands with you and I love it. And like, I'll, I'd love to go through the process again. It's a fun experience. I, like I talk on behalf of them. Like it's, it's enjoyable. Um, we got a real kick out of that doing two brands. And I don't think it'll be the last one we probably do with you either. So anyone that's watching this or listening, if you're thinking about, you know, if you're thinking about going down the brand path, give Tim a ring because it it it's not just about a logo. Yeah, it's, it, I think it's about I think it's about trying to have a conversation with someone and go, cool, because I think a lot of the time too they don't know. Mm. Like I have these. Conversations that's your job though to draw it out of them, like, isn't it? You're like I can tell pretty quickly on that phone call, like if they're uncertain or unsure, or just testing it out. So yeah. yeah, but what about you, mate? What's on your Agenda for the. I'll tell you after this potty. <laughs> Don't want to give it all away. Well, no, no, we'll keep it. We'll, we'll keep it between you and I just for the minute. That'll be for another day. That's good. I'm yeah, now we got some good it. ideas. We'll share with you, but, um, mate, it's been a great insight, and and again, you should be really proud of what you created. Again, journey from, from real estate taking the leap and going out and doing something that you know, makes your heart sing, and and we're you know, following your dreams. You know, you call it life LBD life by design. I mean, you you're exactly doing what that stands for. Um, you should be proud of what you've done, mate. You, you. You, you run a good business and we're proud to be um, aligned with it. And, you know, I think that you've got a really bright future. So we're excited to watch it. But thanks for sharing. Thanks, mate. Pleasure. We, um, it's, yeah, it's been a good chat. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Tim.